last thing that I want to do here, because this is something that you could run across as a potential example, is what happens to the level of employment in a given market with the introduction of unionization. Now, you can have two distinctly different results to that event, to unionizing a given industry, for example, depending on what the demand curve for labor actually looks like. So here what we've got is one demand curve that's relatively flat or more elastic. We have one that is relatively inelastic or relatively more inelastic because it's steeper with supply curves that are supposed to look pretty much the same. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, the demand for labor means how many people um, the firms actually need to employ. Supply here being the workers, the demand being the firms. Okay, when we're talking about labor, that's what we're looking at. When we look at the equilibrium price of labor, the equilibrium price is going to be the market wage. Okay, how much are people actually going to get paid? Now, the first thing that tends to happen when an industry becomes unionized is that the labor union will try to jack up the wage to try to get better wages and more benefits for the workers. So let's say, for example, that with the impact of unionization, the price of labor, your market wage, goes up to this level right here. Oops, that's not straight. Okay. So that's the price with unionization. It's, PU. It's, it's the PU. All right. So now, how many people are still going to be employed? If you are a labor union, do you want to try to bring in the people in this industry, or would you rather try to bring into your industrial union people in this industry? Well, here's how you would figure that out. With this higher price, the number of people still employed depends on the demand curve. So, this was our level of employment before the union came in. This is our level of employment after. This distance represents how many people just got fired. See ya. They are expendable. Maybe they've just been replaced by robots. Okay? That's happened. Or it just or got maybe, cheaper to replace them with robots. Or maybe they've been replaced by overseas production facilities, which is probably a lot more likely to happen in the age of globalization than to be replaced by a robot, which happened to a lot of people in the same 60s and 70s. So over here, we now have this number of people who still have a job. Not going to be a very popular union, not going to be around very long if they've caused, you know, three quarters of the workforce to have nothing to do with their free time. Be a lot more free time now. It's not good. Now over here, where we have the more inelastic demand for labor, the level of hiring is going to again depend on the demand curve. We're going to drop that down here. And now we've only lost this much. So over here, this is the number lost jobs. So this is our level of employment with a more inelastic demand for labor once we have the unionization happen. Over here, this is our level of employment. So if a union is considering whether or not to unionize employees, they would much rather do it with a more inelastic demand for labor. Now, how does that translate into regular old English? These workers are indispensable. When the company has to pay them a much higher wage, they still have jobs because they are necessary. Over here, these workers are expendable. And with a much higher wage, they all just got pink slips. So this is the kind of 
real world application, the real world situation that really does come into play with things like elastic and inelastic curves. And you can see the evidence of this in any labor market that goes from a non-union to a union or from a non-union shop to a union shop. It happens everything. 